Now, the one thing you can say about New York, of course, is it gets a pretty crowded place when it comes to museums, and not just any old museum, but first class, world class museum. So within just a couple of miles from where I am, if it, even if it's that, you have the Guggenheim, where we of course have broadcast from. You have the Met, where we have been, the Whitney, and now we add to that list MoMA. They are just the principal ones, and you can see the tight nature of them all uh, in such a, sh a short few blocks from each other. So how to stay competitive and relevant when the competition is so strong? I spoke to the director of MoMA and asked about his neighbours. Glenn Lowry told me competition was healthy. Well, then he would say that. Well, we are in competition with each other, but we are friendly rivals. We are not cutthroat in the sense of having to win some competition. What we are, however, is extremely cognizant that we each offer the very same donors different possibilities and different opportunities. Many of our donors are also major donors to other museums in this city and elsewhere in the country. Can you compete when pieces come on the market? Not with the traditional museums, but I'm thinking of obviously with private funds, uh, particularly um, the, the mega rich in the world. And then you've got the museums of the Gulf, the art galleries of the Gulf and those of China, which seemingly have unlimited funds. So we can compete. It's not, not easy, but we are in a very fortunate position where we already have an extraordinary collection from the late 19th century right. through most of the 20th century. So when the hyper expensive works of art, which often tend to be works from the last 100 years as opposed to of the very moment, we don't need that many to continue to amplify our collection. But when they do come up, we have the capacity to deaccession, which is a fancy word to say we can sell works from our collection. Which you've done. Which we do on a fairly regular basis to buy other works of art. We don't sell those works of art to support operations or salaries. We sell those works of art in order to buy more art. And what that means is we have this enormous resource that we can turn to when there are critically important works of art that we feel are essential to the museum. I'm feeling a little bit guilty, guilty pleasures, because I'm heading straight for the famous stuff. Ah, uh, well, Starry Night, you can't do better than that. One of the most extraordinary paintings in our collection, maybe one of the most extraordinary paintings anywhere in the world. People literally come here from all over the world just to see this picture. Why? Because it is so intensely beautiful and mystical and painted with these really heavy, thick strokes and you sense the energy, but you also sense Van Gogh's ability to see into the night. Not the night, but into the night. You just want to stand there and suck, be sucked into it, don't you? Particularly in the art world, where people will sort of want to talk about the artsy-fartsy, but the reality is, you've got to keep the lights on, you've got to get the things on the wall, and you've got to get people giving you money so you've got to keep, you can keep the whole thing going. There's no question that running a museum has a business-like dimension to it. We don't do it for the business side, we do it actually for the art side. But in order to have this Cezanne on the wall, in order to have the capacity to think about how to display this Cezanne requires a curatorial staff, it requires a conservation staff, it requires lighting designers, exhibition designers. A host of people have to come into play and they need to be supported somehow. And those lights need to be on. And that requires the capital to do it and to do it well. Part of what we do is about seduction. We want you to come in and first of all, enjoy discover, have pleasure in looking at art, but we also want to challenge and make it a, an experience that is about thinking and about learning. I've got a lot of this in my garden. Ah, uh, yes. You know, bit of old rubble. Bit of rubble, but you know, a little bit of rubble squeezed and played with suddenly becomes something else in the hands of an artist like Duchamp. Yeah, now, why is this art? Because the artist says it's art, but also... No, it, but why did you give it the stamp of approval to say it's art? Because it's curious, it's strange, it, it bends your mind, it makes you think, it's awkward. It forces you to ask that very question, why is this art? So I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked your counterpart at the Met. On the day that you retire, 
The Board of Trustees says he's been here for more than 20 odd years. Good man, excellent. We're going to give him <coughs> either the original or the replica of any piece in the collection. What piece are you going to take home with you that, under your arm that the guard won't find? So that's, an, you know, that's, that's like asking a parent which child does he prefer, right? It's, yes. On Monday it's this one and on Tuesday it's another one. I, from a very early age, was enamored with Cezanne. So I happened to think of Cezanne as one of those mind-bogglingly brilliant artists. And we happen to have a number of extraordinary Cezannes. But I think I would walk home, if I were so allowed, uh, with Boy with a Red Vest, uh, and a, a remarkable portrait that Cezanne made, one that was owned by David Rockefeller. And my, I am the David Rockefeller director of the Museum of Modern Art because David was one of the great patrons of this institution. He was one of those people who believed in the future. And so that painting for me is not only extraordinary because it's a Cezanne, because it's one of Cezanne's finest portraits, it's extraordinary for me because of its relationship to someone who means so much to me and who has meant so much to this institution.